Good morning to everybody. Welcome to the second day of our uh, second workshop on methodologies for official statistics. We are at the point of the third masterclass. And the topic of the masterclass of today, uh, given by Fabio Ricciato from Eurostat, is about quality for innovative data sources, progress, challenges, and direction of work for the European statistical system. Fabio, the floor is yours. Thanks, Daniela, and uh, I start thanking uh, uh, ISTAT for giving me the opportunity to um, um, intervene in this um, um, workshop, which is much more crowded than last year. <laughs> Um, I see, uh, uh, but less crowded the next year, I hope. Uh, so I was invited to, uh, to give a talk on the quality for new data sources. And um, what I will try to do today is starting to remind ourselves what we mean by quality in official statistics, um, why we are dealing with new data sources, what kind of data sources we have in mind, we should, we should address and which one we sh should better not address. And also I would like to move be one step fo forward, uh, let's say with respect to just merely uh, list uh, the long pile of challenges and try to um, be a bit more constructive and also indicate some concrete directions of work and how this direction of work interact uh, with each other and form, let's say, a coherent vision and big picture. And of course, being in Eurostat, uh, I, my talk will have a very strong European orientation, which means it's neither at the national level nor at the global level. So I will target a European scope. So that's what I will try to do in this like short, less than one hour that I, am, that I borrow from your time. So let's, um, as I said, uh, let's try, la, remind ourselves what quality means in the quality of official statistics. And um, what better source uh, than the quality assurance framework that was adopted, um, I think the latest edition in 2017 by the European statistical system. These are the two, the two page, the first page, the, the, the table of content. And already from the length and the number of items, these are just sections, every section develops. Uh, let's see, we understand that it's a very broad um, concept that of course include uh, goodness of an estimate, you know, accuracy, but that's just one of many other items that are there. Uh, starting from the bottom, um, we, by quality, we mean a number of quality dimensions for the statistical output, uh, the relevance, accuracy, reliability, timeliness, uh, etc. And in order to um, assure that the, the statistical output enjoys, let's say, these properties, has an acceptable level of quality along all these dimensions, it is clear that we need to uh, have a good processes. And therefore, the second part um, address the statistical processes uh, uh, with respect to methodology, uh, the statistical procedure, also with a look on the burden on the res respondents, because clearly, up to now, uh, let's say the uh, main source of statistics is a survey, also administrative data, but you can see that the, the scope of this quality framework is very much oriented at one particular class of data that is survey, the survey. Uh, cost effectiveness also. And it's clear that in order to have, so if in order to have good output, you need to have good process or healthy process. In order to have healthy processes, you need to embed them into a healthy environment, and that's the first part. The institutional environment, uh, professional independence um, is the very first thing, is the very first thing that, that we demand from, us, from, statistic, from official statistics, impartiality, etc. I don't, I don't need to, to lecture on this. You, you, most of the people here know this stuff definitely better than I do. I just want to make sure that we understand when, when quality happens, when we encounter the term quality in the, in the 
presentation, we have in this mind this very broad and all-encompassing uh, framework. Okay. Another important aspect that we should keep in mind, and it's, it's not as, let's say, intuitive for people working outside the official statistics, is that the quality in official statistics, but also official statistics, is an evolving thing. It's something that grows like a child. Uh, it grows, it evolves. Uh, and in fact, in these slides, I have, uh, I'm reporting, uh, let's say, the different versions of the norms that regulate the, let's say, the official statistics, as I said, at the European level, right? The code of practice uh, was um, um, the first version dates back from, from 2005, the code of practice of European statistics. It was already revised twice every seven years, right? And as uh, uh, Monica Pratesi yesterday mentioned, it's perhaps about time that we also refresh it, also because the European the legislation on European statistics is now under revision. First version was uh, regulation 223 from 2009. It was already revised in 2015, and one of the innovations was, was that uh, administrative data were brought into 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 the legislation. And right now, as we talk, there is now um, a second revision, proposal for a revision that is being worked out uh, by the co-legislators. So um, Euro European Commission, under um, let's say, initiative by Eurostat, uh, approved a proposal uh, in June, I think, uh, this year, and is now being discussed with the Parliament and with the Council, and we expect and hope uh, that will be adopted uh, bef by the end of this legislature, by uh, mid of 2024. So let's see if and what will be the final text, but clearly one of the motivation for <coughs> uh, um, proposing this revision is to bring uh, new data sources into the game no? at the legislative level. And if you do a legislative level, probably uh, this you can, you can, it, it's difficult to say that you, you, you propose a new legislation and you can live with the code of practice from, from eight years before. So probably this will need, need to be revised. And the quality assurance framework that is strongly tied with the code of practice a bit more at the operational level has been also revised, to, revised already once in 2019. Okay? So as you see, we are talking about a flow. There is a concept in flow. Official statistics and quality is something that evolves. And this is important. We have to, not only we have to be ready, but we, we, we are expected to refresh the concept and to expand. Not to change in the sense that the new version will contradict any of the items of the previous version, but, but it will add more. It will go wider and deeper, right? And uh, it will be things that might be aspirational in one version becomes more prescriptive in the next version. Well, that's what we should expect. But why do we care so much about quality in official uh, statistics? As uh, um, the talk yesterday by Stefano Jakus mentioned, I think it was the second slide, is because official statistics have an impact. They uh, influence opinions and decisions by citizens, by policymakers, by business, by researchers. So opinions and decisions, what you think and what you do. Uh, so who controls the information uh, based on which decisions and opinions are taken has a big power, right? And we want this power uh, to be democratically and socially uh, controlled in, so impartial, independent, and also up to the highest professional standard give, that, 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 that are possible given the current uh, situation, uh, technological situation. So quality is the differentiator of official statistics versus all other statistics. Statistics created by commercial entities, uh, statistics uh, created by other public bodies, yes, there was some mentioning some, some statistics by other uh, public bodies that might be intermittent, you know, might come or not come depending on, the, on whether some, some project is launched or not. No, 
among the quality, the regularity of the release is one of the aspects of quality, and quality always comes in official statistics with a strong commitment. So if you move an official statistics, a, a statistics from the from the playground of experimental statistics, right, into the garden of official statistics, you commit, you have a commitment, that's a big step. I would like also to stress that official statistics are also different from uh, statistics that are produced by the NSI under the label of experimental statistics. There's a very big step between experimental statistics and official statistics. And what is in between the commitment and the quality? Hmm? With experimental statistics, you can have like one off case study, you can make a very nice paper, you can publish something on the website, and this is good. This is good, uh, they serve multiple purposes. They serve the purpose of um, familiarizing with the new method, with the new data sources, building knowledge and expertise in the house, also improving the reputation, showing that NSI do cool things, right? <laughs> Smart things, innovative. Um, um, nominally, they also serve to collect feedback from the user. This is what we say. I don't know how much feedback did we ever get from a statistics, experimental statistics, but this is also, this is there to serve, to serve this. So there are, they have a role, they have multiple purpose, but probably you don't want to base decisions and opinions based on experimental statistics because what we, where they are missing is the whole pile of quality um, safeguards uh, uh, that instead uh, mark the official uh, statistics, right? So when we talk about official statistics, that's basically talking about quality statistics. Hmm? If there is no quality in the broad sense that we've mentioned before, you cannot, you should not be calling them official statistics. Now, when the new data source comes into play, into, into the game, wh why at the end of the day we want to, we want to have, we want to mess up with the new data sources, why? Just because it's cool, because everybody else does it, and no. It's because we, we see that there are some potential gains in terms of quality, particularly quality of the statistical output. Yesterday, um, Stefano say, well, new data source, uh, even non-official statistics are there to fill the gaps, you know, to fill gaps in, inform in the information demand that official statistics cannot or cannot yet uh, fulfill, uh, to measure phenomena that are not just yet measured, uh, to measure phenomena that are measured but with better level of details, right? So we expect to have an improvement of quality along certain dimensions with new data sources. So, so they are enabler. Uh, so the goal is not to use the, the data source. The goal is to improve the quality, the, some of the quality dimensions on the output that you see there. Uh, we hope to have more, better, richer, and timelier uh, statistics. And this is important, not better, richer, timelier, maybe even more cost-effective statistics than we do today. Uh, excuse me, more better than we do today, but also, in particular, more better, richer, timelier, and more cost-effective statistics than would be possible without these data sources. Yeah, so if you can get the more, better, timelier, etc., by other means that are maybe cheaper or easier, you do that, right? But in certain cases, as I will show, uh, already Stefano uh, said yesterday, in certain cases, you cannot think of achieve, achieving a certain level of spatial detail, temporal continuity, temporal detail, uh, or some additional variables without the use of these other data sources. So they are instrumental to improve quality on certain dimensions and fill uh, data gaps. So in this sense, um, also, uh, we should also think, and I will come back to this point, as a new data source augmenting, so statistics based on new data sources, to be augmenting and not replacing the current set of official statistics. We are not aiming and doing the same with less, but are doing more. Uh, I think, uh, so we can improve on timeless and punk uh, timeless, Stefano said yesterday, with, with certain data sources, you can have near real-time statistics. Another story is whether 
official statistics needs to be near real time, right? Maybe you don't really need to, to, to publish the data from yesterday, okay? But still, between publishing the data from yesterday and publishing the data from last year, maybe <laughs> there's some room for shooting in the middle, right? Um, they also have the possibility to improve coherence and comparability because the, if they are based on technological processes that are uniform around, around Europe, right? This is a smartphone that has more or less the same technology around Europe. There are no national specificities, as is the case with administrative data, for instance. It, they intrinsically help comparability and coherence um, among countries. You could improve accuracy and reliability along in certain way, in certain meaning, in certain directions, not in all. And you can improve relevance because you can provide statistics that today cannot be delivered with the uh, traditional data source. So you can fill information gap, as Stefano yesterday, said yesterday. And, and you can also, in, in a certain sense, you can reduce the burden of respondents compared to what they have, they had to do if you would uh, re aim at the same level of timeliness, richness, and uh, level of details based only on, on asking the people, right? So this is the promise. There are some potential gains to be ripe there. But there is also a long list of challenges. Huh? So if there are opportunities and there are challenges, gains and pains. Uh, they touch basically almost every aspect of the statistical production, therefore the processes, and of the environment. Not of an SI environment, but especially because most of these data sources are generated outside the statistical office. The, env the environment now <laughs> becomes larger. The environment is not just the NSI. The environment is also the data, the data provider. So we have a, an expansion of the environment. Huh? This is not only institutional, because, because also uh, private organizations are involved. And this requires rethinking a number of items that I see list. I'm, I'm not lecturing e of each and every, but you know, from these red lines, you see these are the point of attention where we need to at least reconsider whether some improvement, change, expansion, revision of the concept and of the guidelines and of a criterio, criterion is needed. And on top of that, I, have a, I also think that there are keywords that perhaps we should add uh, to the to the quality assurance framework, to the code of practice, things that I have not mm, found in the current version, because of course it's not, they are they not needed, they were not needed, but they might be needed if we now uh, uh, start this exercise of reconsidering the uh, quality assurance framework. For instance, we might consider whether public acceptance becomes an aspect to take care of, uh, compliance with non-statistical legislation. If you want to reuse MNO data, you have to look into telecom data, and this is painful. Huh? E-privacy directive these days is a, is a, is a showstopper. Let's see. Uh, if you want to use uh, uh, energy meter, you have to look do into, into sectoral legislation into the energy. So. Uh, for the legal team here, it's not only about statistical legislation. Huh? It's not only about uh, data protection legislation. Uh, it's not only about Data Governance Act or Data Act, especially Data Governance Act a suggestion to the people in ISTAT working on Smart Survey. Have a look at Data Governance Act. There are legal enablers that are in the sense of data altruism and data donation that are useful for the concept of, of Smart Survey. Uh, but you also have to look into sectoral legislation of the business sectors from where the date you want you want to use the data. You have to partner at the end of the day with the data holders, some partnership. Huh? Uh, maybe it's a forced marriage, but it will have to be a marriage. <laughs> maybe it's forced, or maybe it's not a marriage of love. Maybe it's a marriage of interest, maybe it's a forced marriage, but you have to marry, you have to coexist, and there are implications also on the processes that we need to, to reconsider. It's about time the reproducibility of methods is added to the transparency. Transparency is, is important. Reproducibility now is, is also something we should, we should look into. 
And there are aspects related to the automatization of, 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 of the data processing and softwareization on which I will return later. So there is not only to revise the existing items, the message to be taken is that there are some items that probably we need to add. And assuming that we have done this exercise, so on one side the opportunities and the, and the gains, on the other side the pains, uh, there is a balance, right? Do the gains, uh, let's say, um, are, are, are the pains worth the gains? Is it, is it, is it worth it to walk this path? Huh? Uh, so you have to balance the benefit uh, and the efforts uh, required to solve the challenge. And the balance will not always be positive. Huh? Uh, we, so if, let's say, the first commandment when entering into the uh, uh, swamp of a new data source for official statistics is uh, that we should be selective. We should be choosy to cite the minister from Italy, no? We should be choosy. Um, for certain new statistical data sources, we can already, let's say, reason and we can already expect that the benefit will be small compared to the efforts, okay? Because remember, non-statistical data sources may be reused for statistics, but they also may not. <laughs> uh, I may think, I could think of uh, techno technologies or business sectors that are still not widely deployed. Hmm? Precision agriculture is not yet mature. How many farmers have uh, IoT agriculture? Yes. At some point, maybe there will be the majority, but at some point, not now, right? Um, or maybe there are technologies that are widespread, that are adopted, but are so heterogeneous that it's really a huge effort uh, to even think of, 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 of plug into that. For instance, I personally think smart city. Smart city is a cool term, but when you look into the market, you have it's not standardized, maybe not yet, but it's definitely not standardized. The data format, the data semantics, uh, every city ha ha has a different one. Uh, on the vendor side, so the IoT vendors, there are no, no de, de facto or de jure standards out there. It's all proprietary technology. Do you really need want to develop hundreds of API? And, and study hundreds of different um, combination of, of, of syntax and semantics, and to do what? I mean, this is scary, right? So the idea is not, not the big, because something is cool from, from some paper from a very, um, uh, let's say, high level in a research institution does not automatically mean that this is interesting for official statistics. So I think we should be choosy. We should be choosy at different stage of the, of the process. So I think, um, we have to do a reasonable assessment at the beginning, right? And make a short list of interest of, of data sources that pass the first gate. And for this we, this, we can attempt to do some methodological research. research. And then have a second gate, you know, when we understand how difficult are from the... So the first gate is how difficult it is just to access this data. It's just to or how, how heterogeneous are these data. The second gate is that, for the short list, is how difficult it is to transform this data into useful statistics or insight, right? Uh, and we should be ready to reject and to trash uh, data sources along, along, the, along the path, okay? And only at the very beginning, at the very end, excuse me, some, some, some data source will pass these gates and will be that we will be sure that the effort that we need to pay are, are worth the, the gain. The dimensions that we should consider, for instance, at the first gate, is the technological or market penetration, as I said before. How many statistical units can be reached by this technology, right? Um, mobile phone data in 1992 could not be used for statistics because 1% one, 1 of the population had it and only on the high level, right? Uh, what spatial coverage do you have at European level? Uh, maybe you have some data sources that are uh, readily available and deployed in three countries, but not in the other. From a European statistics point of view, that's, that's not enough. Huh? Uh, we have also had to look at the technological and market stability. Uh, can we expect, so if we make statistics based on the um, iPod, 
iPod, not iPad. No? Uh, how, how, what is the lifetime of this market, of this, of this, of this uh, technology? Uh, because we, they, will, they will not be there in 15 years just to allow us to make statistics, right? <laughs> so we have to be a little bit strategic uh, in, in thinking already at the, at the same gate, uh, at, at the first gate. So I would like to stay away from data where the market and or the technology are too fragmented uh, to provide a solid, a solid basis uh, uh, for, for work. And this, you don't need to do experimental statistics to do this. You, you can do this just a desktop analysis as a serious uh, desktop research. You can already uh, make this, prep, this selection, right? Uh, okay, and this dimension also depends on market structure, market, market concentrations. How many players are in the market? Huh? Um, in some markets, there is no standard because there are just three players. Uh, basic, de, de facto, they are, they are the standard, right? Think of a tourist platform, for instance. Uh, in other markets, maybe there are many players, but there is a standard, technology standard or de facto standard. So we have to, we have to make this analysis. The other, so the first command is be choosy. Um, the other, the second, the second, let's say, uh, suggestion that I would give um, is that, and this I'm borrowed, I'm borrowing this from the result of the SNET on Big Data 2, uh, which was closed in 2020 and released very interesting uh, final report. I think the, some, the key people behind the report are here and are smiling. Uh, so, once that you select the, the sources, uh, don't expect that you can really develop a single methodology or a single quality framework that covers all of them. Huh? So these data sources need to be grouped into classes that are acceptably homogeneous, and then you develop methodology and quality standards, guidelines, criteria, processes for this class. Uh, because there are the specific, there are strong specificities and difference between one class and the other. Think of MNO data, mobile network operator data on one hand, web scraping data, and heart observation data. Almost any dimension you can think of is different, including the error source. So, no, there are type of error in the earth observation that are not find, found in web scraping, not even in survey, etc. So every data source comes with his own peculiarity. Uh, I think it's naive to expect that there is, that one data, that the, 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 the dimension of error and uncertainty from one data source are homomorphic to all the others. They have specificities in the process, in the market, in who, who has the data, what are the error source of the data, uh, the uncertainty dimensions that you need to, to take care of. Uh, so the quality methodology needs to be tailored and, and developed independently for, for, one, for every source. But this does not exclude that once that you do a serious job on one of these data sources, some of the work can be reused or it can be at least indicate the direction and be insp inspirational for the others. So not always you have to duplicate all the work. Do the work in one data source and you find that maybe 50% of the things are similar with some adaptation or at least inspirational for the other data sources. But if you try to develop a framework, quality framework that is encompass all what is not administrative data, not survey data, then in the best case you end up with some very abstract blah, 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 that is not operationally, operational, cannot be operation, operationalized. And the quote from these slides are taken exactly from the, from the report on the SNET Big Data to, to Work Package K. So I give credit to the people who work there. Now, from now on, I will, I will be coherent with what yes, I'm saying, and I will restrict to just one macro class, let's say, of, of, of new data sources, that is data sources uh, um, that are based on digital traces, that are granular, some transactions, and uh, where the data points happen um, are generated at, at the sub-micro level. So it's not for the statistical unit, but at every transaction level. Nanodata, uh, uh, the Eurostat term is uh, nanodata in some papers. 
that data that are generated as all new data sources primarily for non-statistical purposes, so it can be a business, typically it's a business need, uh, and then may or may not be reused for, for statistics. And I'm focusing on data that are um, collected in the private sector by private company. Uh, so the one prominent example is the mobile network operator data. Why I talk about the mobile network operator data? Because they are more important than others. No, because first, because I know them. This is where I work, so I'm qualified to work about the MNO data. I don't feel qualified to lecture on web scraping data or earth observation data. It's not my field. Uh, and second, because there is a corpus of activity happening now at the European statistic, uh, at the ESS level, at the European level, on which I will, I will mention during the talk, that are focused on MNO data, but also say, at least inspirational for other uh, data sources. So that's why I restrict to talk about what I know. Huh? So, the most important point to be taken in this slide is that reusing data held by somebody else, so MNO, for instance, or in the case of credit card uh, by the credit card co credit card transaction by the credit card company, is, yes, it surely is a matter of data, yeah, of course, but it's much more a matter of processes. In this slide, you see two entities: the private data holder and the statistical institutes, and two processes. Uh, and of course, there are also the statistical units that from, the pri from our side are the statistical units, so people or companies, in this case people. From the side of the private data holder, they are customers. There is some data generation process. In the case of mobile phone data, this is the interaction between the phone and the network. And these data are used for some purpose. In the case of MNO, this is billing or uh, troubleshooting the network infrastructure. For credit card data, this is uh, payment, uh, basically. So this data generation process is the oval, the red oval there. Some data are created, and we wish to reuse this data for another process, that is the statistical production process. You have the red and the blue process. These are two processes. Now, keeping in mind that the data generation process is optimized for something else that is not statistics. So it's optimal from their perspective. It's much, very suboptimal from our perspective. Typically, the primary purpose is, is also a, a market need. Um, and, and this happens typically in a competition environment. So I may not compete with each other. Credit card company compete with each other. And competition creates dynamics. They change the technology, they change the tariff. Uh, the change is uh, seeked by the, by the market. It's not something bad that needs to be avoided, like it's for us, because we would like to have stable, uh, you know, infinite time series, uh, stable stationary. So change is something, we are, is a problem for us. No, for them, they change, they seek to change, they seek to evolve the technology. So the data generation process change and this contradicts that we like to have a stable, 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 stable statistic. We have to do something, right? So I would say that the data generation process is dynamic because there are changes in businesses, changes in technology, change in tariffs, and each of these change include a change into the data, data semantic, data um, temporal, uh, temporal characteristics, etc. Customer churning, so companies, customers move from one service provider to another, right? In some markets they do rarely, in some other markets they do more often, right? And they don't do as a Poisson process stationary. Maybe there, are, there is a launch of a new marketing campaign and a lot of people move from one operator to another. So it's also, uh, let's say, irregular. When they don't change their service provider, cast, users of this service change their behavior. Hmm? Uh, think of credit card uh, payment. Maybe people start to use credit card also for micropayment, for smaller payment, which was not maybe the case some years ago. You have changed churning. You have changed in user behavior. Some of these changes are planned by the, event, by the system operator and, and known in advance. No? 
They will launch, they will make a new software upgrades of the antenna. They will move to 5G. Um, or they will launch a new tariff and they expect a big inflow of new customers. So some of this change can be, can be known in advance. Some other change comes unexpectedly unwanted. An outage of some antennas, some part of antenna, some, um, they, that really did, re, um, if, if, one, if one operator has a failure in a certain area, you have a drop of, of, of user from this operator, but some of the, some of the mobile user will cascade into the other operator, will roam into other data. So a failure in one operator will have a, a consequence in the data also from the other operators and so forth. So all these are facts, events, that affect the, the quality of the, of the input data, affect the data and their quality, and therefore we have to do something with them. Uh, in the process, along the process of, of producing statistics. The least that we have to do is to detect and be aware of them. Most likely we also have to mitigate their effect in the, in the, final, in the final statistics. And to do this, we need information about the process and information about the uh, performance of the process, meaning the generation process, the data generation process. And referring to ESS handbook for quality and metadata reports, I think you call this data reference metadata, operational metadata, or paradata. But here I'm on the learning side, you are the expert. So I think this is what you mean by paradata. Paradata, reference metadata, is data that needs to be produced by a process. So you will see, we have to enrich the slides. What we want from the data holder is not just the data and the structural metadata, the location data, more or less aggregated, more or less pre-processed, but we also want to have a flow of reference metadata, operational metadata about the process. Did, was there an outage? Did you see, is there a reason why you expect some change um, in the data provision, in the semantic of, of the data provision? And these are uh, part of this data, can, part of this communication um, can be automatized. And this is what you see there uh, with the, in the red cylinder, can be automatized. We already know that there will be outage. We, already, we don't know when they will happen, but we know. So we can foresee a system for automatic reporting. We already know. Uh, so certain metadata have a structure that we can predict and we can prepare the machine to exchange this data automatically. Even to process this uh, metadata automatically if we, if, we are, if, if, we are, if we are able to do so. But there will be all, always data that matters a lot for quality that needs to be detected and reported at a human level. There are unexpected events, things that you did not expect. As I say, large scale outage or that uh, needs to be detected, that involve humans and these are the arrows below. Uh, and for all these errors means communication of data or metadata or paradata means communication means that you need to have an interface. What is an interface? Well, you have to agree when we talk, we have to, this data, we have to agree on the format of this data, the semantic of this data, we have to agree on policy. No? What are the relevant data, para reference data that I need to know? and uh, who takes care of communicating to whom, and who learned this data, I should do what? This is all policies, right? Formats, um, forms. Does it go via email? Does it go via online form? Um, who, should, who is in charge of looking at the data, understanding of, of the reference data, if this needs, how to deal with it? These are all rules, policies. Uh, from the technical level, if it's an online form, you have to write the form, no? uh, produce the form with certain fields, but also rules at the organizational level. It's quite some work and always involves machines and humans. And also it's bi-directional because not always you can expect that the operator, the MNO or the data providers will proactive, you would like and you have to agree with, with the operator that will proactively give you as much information as possible. But sometimes 
you will process your data and you will detect that there is some anomalies, that there is something strange, and you have to go back and say, we have detected this and that. Is this due to a genuine change of behavior or maybe there is something happening in your network that you did not report? Maybe you did not report because you were not even aware of that. Huh? And, and it does not happen infrequently that if you get data, maybe you can detect things that the operator has not detected. Maybe because you can compare with the data from another operator. I will come back to this point in a moment. So we have to report, but we also have to balance the, between the under-reporting, so it's too little information that will, uh, or un over reporting you cannot, uh, let's say, the MNO cannot work primarily for the NSI, right? So they have to be, there must be a balance. And remember, it's also bi-directional. How to motivate the data holders to do all that? We know that incentives will not be enough. Huh? So we already know that, why we know, uh, for instance, in, well, maybe, let's say, are not enough in most cases. Maybe there can be some exceptions where negotiation was enough, uh, but in most cases, this will not be enough. Huh? We need legislative uh, obligations, probably, but even legislative obligations on its own will not be enough. You force them to collab, to, to provide your data, but, you know, how much data and how accurate data um, it's not enough to have to have a legislative obligations. Uh, or maybe you can le use the leverage of cost compensation. So you, you not pay for the data, but you, you compensate the efforts for producing, for instance, the, the metadata, the paradata. What do we need? What, what do we, according to the final report of the expert group on facilitating the use of new data source for official statistics, or that Eurostat set up in 2021-22, uh, you need a blend of all that. Hmm? You need legislative obligations that, we, that are there in the current proposed text of two to three regulations, by the way, but it's not enough. You also need to provide incentives. You cannot just force them. Um, you, you, have to, you have to, they, the, the operators, have to find an interest in collaborating with NSI. Which interest? We have some idea. I hope I have the time to go quickly through them. How much time? I, I can. The time I need. Okay. I hope your seats are comfortable because we can go long. Okay. I will come back in incentive from a moment. Another important point. I think it's of utmost importance that NSI aim at producing final statistics that are never based on a single data, the inflow from a single data holder, but are uh, so always aim at combining together data from different data holders. In the case of MNO, by at least three MNO in every country. In the case of credit card data, by the main credit card company. Huh? So I would even write this into the, code of, in the quality assurance framework if, if it was up to me to write it. And why? There, are, there is a pile of motivations for willing to do so. And I'm borrowing this motivation by the position paper that the uh, ESS Task Force on MNO data produced uh, earlier this year. And again, many of the people that contributed uh, to write this report and are members of the task force are, are sitting in this room. Um, first of all, you, as every operator, just address a chunk, a, a, ch a part of the, of the total population. They have customers, right? And, uh, and by definition, customers is a part of the population. Um, when you mix data from different operators, you, you have diff better representativeness of the total population. The bias, uh, the bias that each customer, ba the, the customer basis of each operator has, of each data provider has, combine with the other, uh, maybe do not completely cancel, but they meet, you mitigate uh, the, the, the bias. You mitigate the coverage bias in the final statistics. You improve the temporal stability, uh, and mitigating the effect of customer churning because the, you know, the mobile user will move from one operator to another, but if you catch all of them, they are still in the basket. Huh? 
so they don't go in and out, just, uh, just move between data inflows that, that you get. You mitigate the sensitivity to certain provide specific aspects of data generation um, that are there. Uh, for instance, um, um, you might have, yeah, in certain, op in certain countries, some operator are very strong in one region, but less in the others. So by combining them together, you also have a better spatial coverage. You have an improved robustness to anomalies, outage. If there is an outage from one operator, at least you have the data from the other two, you can mitigate. I'm not saying that the outage will have no effect, but the effect on the final statistics, if you have foreseen this case and prepared for this case in the methodology, will be mitigated. There are also strategic aspects because you are basically treating the three, op the three or four operators at the same level. So you are not interfering with their business because if you have a, co if you have a, a partnership with one but not on the other, there is some asymmetry. I cannot say who, which one is, if, you, if they prefer to be the one collaborating with an SI or not collaborating, but whatever, there is an asymmetry and we avoid asymmetries. And last but not least, there is an easy, it makes it much easier for the NSI to publish final statistics that do not disclose business sensitive information by the operators, right? So it's much easier. So at the end of the day, if you consider all these aspects, strategic aspects, I dare to say that in certain, it's not a theory, but in certain cases, it might be even easier to get the three operator on board than just one. It's sound paradox. But if there is the right legislation is in place and the right set of incentives is in, stay, is in place, it might be easier to have three rather than one. One clear advantage when you have three or more operators is if you can benchmark between them, right? Uh, so it's easier to spot that if an anomaly is in one data flow is probably not, probably not necessarily due to a genuine phenomenon uh, but to some artifact of some data outage, etc. And I, at the coffee break, I can tell you a story about that. Because yesterday, um, um, Stefano Yakus presented a well-behaved case where the three operators have different levels but the same trend. So he was very polite. He didn't show the case where the trend were even different. Huh? Okay, another important point. Not only we need to integrate the data from different operators, but central for this workshop is that we should always aim, in my opinion, at producing statistics that are based on new data sources in combination with some statistical data. Why? Because new data sources, privately held data, look at customers, not citizens, right? And the transition from customer to citizen I think requires some integration with statistical data. Um, if we combine them together, we get the best of both if we can combine them wisely. From the big data, uh, or we can get the timeliness, you know, near real time. We can get spatio-temporal detail. We know the position, at with, with temporal spatial data that would not be possible otherwise. With a temporal continuity, because these services are online 24 seven, with spatial coverage that is typically the whole country and the whole Europe. And we have variables that are derived from objective observations. In the case of location data, where you are, not where you remember you were yesterday or you would declare you are or you have registered, where you really are, it's objective. No? might not correspond to the, to the target variable, because if I ask you where you are you registered, I, cannot, I can infer but not get, get from the amount of data. But if the, the question is where you were sleeping yesterday, then it's objective. From the statistical data, we can correct uh, the projection to the target population and mitigate the, the the problem of bias, coverage gap, gap, multiple counting that are typically affect the, the big data. So we do this macroscopic correction 
And maybe we can also add the variables of interest that we don't find in the big data. In some cases, social demographic data or purpose. No? I know that you were making a trip abroad, but was this for holiday or for tourism? Well, you, MNO data will cannot get you this, but the purpose you might ask. So it's the combination, improve the quality, and also complement, complement the variables. I think this is, this is what we should aim for. And depending whom I, how you're talking with, you can sell this integration as, well, I'm fertilizing big data by statistical data, or I'm augmenting statistical data with big data. You can always find a way to represent this concept to this audience, but it, it's a marriage at the end of the day of data. I would like that you to reason on the strategic benefits of being able to do this, uh, this integration. This integration is, er, is very, let's say, is, is easy to say in this moment with the slide, to, right? It's very easy. Working out the details and the math is very difficult, but we have the brains here, right? So the task is up to them to, to develop the math. But to motivate the brain, the brain that are here to do seriously this work, I would like to stress what benefit would come if they are able to do this integration properly. First of all, the relationship between data holders and NSI changed completely. NSI, I'm not going to beg a data provider in the, in the, in the, with the dress of data consumers. No, you have the data, we want the statistics. No, we have to nudge, force, ask, beg uh, for data inflow. We come with other part of the data, right? And we can show that the final result, the final statistics are not only better for us, but also more useful for you than what would be possible with, the, you could do at home without the NSI. So it's easier to construct win-win partnership. Eh? Always sitting on some legislation and some kind of obligation, but uh, also creating incentives and win-win and, uh, situations. I'm saying that, so, without, with no intention to derogate whatsoever from statistical confidentiality principles. No? I'm not intending to derogate from the st principle that statistical data cannot be used for non-statistical purpose, and we are not talking about passing you know, survey data or micro data. To do. I want to be clear, no derogations on this, but perhaps, if the math method, uh, uh, while working the, the math, we will find out that perhaps just the fact that you publish a reference statistics that integrates different MNO and statistical data and if therefore stable and authoritative, just this will be beneficial to the MNO that have a, a reference against which uh, to recalibrate their own commercial statistics on other variables. Or perhaps we find out that there are some intermediate data along the path towards the final statistics that are non-personal data, can be shared on a bilateral basis without breaking the statistical confidentiality. I'm not promising it, but it's, it's something we could think of because if this happens, you have something to give back. And this is a strong incentive that coupled with legal enablers make this marriage, let's say, love will come, even if I had to marry by force, maybe some love come, come afterwards. And even privacy and NC technology may play a role in, uh, in this game uh, of, of giving back something to the operator to incentivize, because if the operator find, a, find their gain, non-financial gain, but again in uh, collaborating with NSI, then if you go back to the previous slides where they have to report paradata or operational metadata, they will put more effort into providing better metadata because they have an incentive leverage, not because it was written in, in, in some, not only because it was written in some law. Uh, and another, uh, is another, another say, consequence is that the NSI will reassert their, their role and the role of statistical survey in this new data ecosystem. It's not to be feared to be replaced, but actually it's one important component that fertilizes all the other big, but let's say um, big, big, not necessarily intelligent uh, data sources. Eh? Um, and the idea is that you don't want, NSI can, don't need 
necessary to cannibalize the commercial statistics that are out there. So the fact that we, NSI, uh, is that will eventually publish tourism statistics does not, should not be seen as a threat to the operator that want to sell commercial statistics to somebody else. There is space for both. Huh? There are, there is possible to differentiate the variables, to differentiate the temporal or spatial granularity. Maybe that ISTA does not want, does not need to publish statistics on how many tourists were on, on, on some beach yesterday. <laughs> Maybe if enough to publish how many tourists go to the beach during the summer, I don't know, some coarser spatial or temporal resol resolution, leaving the more detailed, fine-grained, near real-time commercial statistics or additional variables or additional domains to, to, the, to, the, uh, to, the, to the commercial operators. So there is space for both, and ideally we establish this cycle. Yeah. Well, uh, five minutes. Okay. So they're, they're not sleeping. So I can entertain them. But maybe they want to discuss exactly. So uh, all this is nice, blah blah blah. Okay, but what do you do concretely, Eurostat, to to make this uh, happen? Uh, this, one thing that we do, in addition to sharing the task force and ML data, in addition to finding the ESnet work package, in addition to uh, establish the expert group, etc., is that we are launching, we have recently launched an ESnet new research grant, the ESnet research grant, focused on the MNO data, uh, uh, focused on the integration between MNO and non-MNO data. This started on the, the 1st of November, has ISTAT as a coordinator, two years, uh, lifetime, three work package, 10 uh, beneficiaries of the grant, most of them sitting here. If you want to know more, ask Tiziana, who is the, uh, will be the coordinator of this SNET. So we are working the talk, let's say, and we have a lot of expectation from this project. Um, I go quickly. So last year I was sitting there, actually, um, and I gave a talk on the softwareization of statistical methods, right? Uh, big data, high volume, high complexity. You cannot do this with Excel file. You have to automatize the data processing. Then the methodology needs to be represented in a formal language, ontologies, programming code, and then the methodology becomes software. So automatization brings softwareization of statistical methodology. You may, uh, um, I, I don't need to re repeat here what I said one, one, one year ago, but the point is that softwareization of statistical methods has a lot of implications, most of them positive uh, for, for the quality, right? because that means that you can publish the source code as a reference metadata uh, and you abide to the transparency in a way that is even more transparent than what can be done uh, today. Um, you foster reproducibility, and then you are not scared to put reproducibility in the next uh, code of practice or quality framework, because this is possible. You allow independent auditability of the methods. You allow collaborative improvements, where the NSI collaborate together. Uh, uh, there are other implications, but uh, let's say I don't need to repeat myself, so you can find the reference from the talk on the paper from, from the last year. But what I want to say here is that standardization, uh, softwareization of methodology also go hand in hand with the standardization of the methodology. Me methodology means here with it, data are given, so you cannot methodologize how data are, are generated because this is out, out of your control, it's not design data. But you can, all the data transformation, uh, you, you can, you have to standardize. If we standardize, then we can provide the same processing pipeline to different operators, right? Different data holders in the, in the same business sectors, such that what they deliver to us can be combined. First, we know what they deliver to us, right? Because we know we have provided code, reference code. We have provided very detailed instructions how, how the, 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 the data points should be transformed, aggregated, corrected, etc. So we can interpret something because this transformation happened with something that we have developed or co-developed with the industry, better co-developed because we don't know, have all the skills and all the knowledge needed to do so. So we partner with the industry expert together to co-develop. 
And second, what we get is comparable, not only comparable, but combinable with the other, with, with the rest from the others. And what are doing Aerostar to move Walk the Talk? Another project is a multi-MNO project that is basically, it was an open call for tender uh, that um, was launched last year and led to the start earlier this year in uh, January of a project where some NSI experts and industry experts join force from different NSI and from different company, industry companies join force, so I basically I average out diversity of skills and competition dynamics and, and uh, collaborate uh, to co-develop the initial version, its initial version uh, will grow, remember the growing, uh, of a reference methodological standards for MNO data that will be released open source. And there are five MNO from four countries that commit to test this on real data. Hmm? So very interesting project, very challenging project, but you know, um, if it's not challenging, it's not, not fun. So the vision will be, five more minutes, I promise, that uh, in 2020 something, MNO data will be reused for the regular production of official statistics, not just experimental statistics, combining data from multiple MNO in each country and across European country, combining them ideally with statistical data, all this stuff processed with methodologies that are standard, open source, fully transparent, and ca are, come hand in hand with quality criteria, guidelines, uh, that are operationally, that have developed together with the standard methodologies. So quality is a task, is a task for instance, in the multi-MNO project. Uh, it's a specific task on quality, very important task. That goes, it's parallel and strongly coordinated with the task on methodology. Based on a methodological framework that is there to evolve, a methodology that is, that is already evolvable by design. We already know that we'll have to change and maintain, but it's designed to be changed and maintained, not be too painful. Where the data are processed at least partially at MNO premises, because this helps a lot with data confidentiality, protection of business interest, um, makes sense, does not make sense to, to bring the micro data in the NSI. I hope by now we, we all, I think, accept this as a, as a given. And last but not least, if we have a standard methodology that is valid for all Europe, then we can, we mean Eurostat, can discuss with the data protection authorities at the European level in order to find out you know, what privacy data protection uh, safeguards have to be taken in order to make this not only legally compliant with data protection, but also acceptable by the public and transparent. So uh, data protection is not only a legal obligation, it's an ethical, it's an ethical uh, duty and comes along with public acceptance. It's, it's not just legal um, compliance. Now to do so, and this I borrowed this uh, picture from the position paper of the task force that many people here has contri have contributed to, right? No, it's like if we need to light the bulb, we need to close all the switch. You know, the, I'm an electrical engineer, so I'm I like this, this picture. So we need to close the switch of uh, uh, standard methodology and quality framework. We need to have an enabling legislation and establish sustainable business model. We need to have data protection measures. If one of these which doesn't close, you will not turn on, let's say, the, the light bulb of producing official statistics based on MNO data. But the way, best way not to do this is to wait for the other to close the switch. So, so okay, I wait for the legislation and then I start working on data protection, on, on, that, on um, methodology, standard methodology and quality framework. Oh, oh, first, I clarify the data protection measures and then I start to do, that doesn't work. You have to be proactive and you have to work in parallel as we are doing on each of these stages, right? Under the, let's say, optimistic assumption that's, that the other switch will be closed. So I de we develop, you develop, the people here are developing standard methodology and quality framework under the assumption that the legislative scenario will be favorable. Under the assumption that data protection measures will come that will not, that, that they will be accepted, right? 
Now, the point is that there are, virtu there are not only blocking interdependencies, there are also virtual, uh, virtuous interdependencies, because if you develop a standard methodology, it's easier to show that it's worth it to have an enabling legislation, right? If you have a standard methodology, it's easier to go to the DPS, the DPB, and say, I need to plug safety measure, privacy sa safeguards here and there. It's not blah, blah, blah. It's really here. And if it's not OK, tell me, OK, what, we, what can we do? So you have a concrete basis. So I would reverse the blocking. So if you are able to close one switch, it's easier to close the other. It's not guaranteed, but it's easier to close the other. And you know, all the pictures, I'm going slowly towards the finish, the, com the conclusion. <laughs> I've mentioned here as net big data to the task force, MNO data position paper, the multi MNO project, uh, the research grant. Um, there are other projects on privacy and ancient technology that Eurostat is conducting, which I did not manage, but if you give me two hours, I can manage. Um, revision of 223, the expert group on B2G4S. You see, these are all activities that are all puzzle of a single, consistent, and coherent uh, vision that we are working on. Uh, basically, this concludes the talk, except that yesterday there were some talks on uh, machine learning, and there will be talk on machine learning afterwards. So uh, this morning I decided to write, to have these two slides that do not, basically, do not refer to what I'm saying until now, so it's, uh, it's an appendix. And maybe my foster the discussion after was in the afternoon. And this is about uh, machine le supervised machine learning in official statistics. Again, reminding ourselves that there is a lot of process work to be worked out maybe in the next version of the quality assurance framework or code of practice. And the idea is that if you have a machine learning model, supervised model, and you have data and results, no input and output, and the model needs to be trained with the labeled data from the top. Uh, and and that I think, and as I cannot avoid, to also monitor the performance of, of the model. Maybe you're using this for classification. Cocoipo, co, co, uh, NACE, Cocoipo, not remember. Maybe you're using there as a classifier. So, and I agree with Li Chun that uh, yesterday said um, explainability might not be needed. So in certain cases, my explainability is not a problem. If I have a black box that classify, but I can measure the rate of false positive or false negatives, it's enough to qualify the box. I can use it. I don't need to explain how he does as long as I can qualify this performance. If the task is just for classifying, right? And anyway, I need to qualify the performance. And this I do with label test data or with the visual inspections, right? So the, he, he, the man behind. So you have these three process, training, inference and classification, and performance monitoring. And each, especially the, the first and the last, needs to be, need process, need rules, need policies. You have to ask who will, Mon how, in which way you monitor the performance of the system, right? Does this involve human inspection or not? If it does involve human inspection, who is in charge? With what skills? With what frequency? And uh, when a drift in performance is detected, you need to trigger a, ref a new training, a fresh retraining. Hey, who, who labeled the data? How many people you need to label the training set? Which skills? Which skill these people will have? There are cost accuracy trade off. And should you publish the training data as a matter of transparency? Maybe yes, maybe not, but at least you should ask the question. How you handle the versioning of the ML, of the different ML models and the versioning of the training data? And last but not least, is there any energy consumption consideration that matters, right? Can you? You should not discover when you get the energy bills that, oh, oops, <laughs> this was energy hungry. You know, and this is just an initial list of things that maybe if you really want to use ML, and it does make a lot of sense to use ML as a component in a bigger process, I expect to enter into the next uh, uh, quality assurance framework. And with that, I conclude, uh, blah, 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 uh, conclude. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Oh.
Well, thank you for your conciseness. <laughs> Thanks for your diplomas. Yeah, of course. And uh, we, were, we are waiting for a very thorough and deep discussion from the audience. Because this was the reason why I uh, compelled the speaker to be concise. So are there questions from the floor? Mm, Dr. Falossi, uh, are you running with, with the microphone? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, of course, uh, the questions from the people that is uh, um, linked via the web uh, uh, are welcome and we can directly uh, uh, see them on our screen, the screen of the speaker. Uh, thank you, your talk was very comprehensive. Okay. Your talk wa was very comprehensive. Only, the uh, I mentioned only two topics. The first is related to privacy, because uh, uh, there is uh, a, a big problem with privacy when dealing with uh, statistical data. But uh, in this case, uh, as you mentioned, the privacy could be relaxed because we are dealing with statistical data that uh, are using a lot of sources, and so there is, uh, we should find some way to relax uh, the condition for privacy when dealing uh, with uh, statistical data in our register. The second uh, aspect is uh, uh, on the question of uh, under-reporting and over-reporting the quality. When uh, we are uh, uh, informing the user on the quality, we must find some unified measure, very simple that remain stable over time and over sectoral sections. And, uh, and so this uh, is uh, an effort we have to deal with. And uh, we have to face uh, with this uh, new environment in which we have uh, statistical registers and different users can produce their own statistics without uh, uh, that are not planned in advance. And so this user should be informed, have some uh, uh, measure of their, uh, of the quality of their new statistic they are producing uh, using uh, uh, statistical register that uh, so, uh, that could be available for external uh, um, computation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, uh, uh, yes, it's what I should like to suggest, please. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you for your nice talk. It's nice to see that you, uh, you, you call yourself statistician now. Um, <laughs> No, I think the trust me, I'm a statistician, refer to you. Um, <laughs> okay, um, for on this experimental statistics, um, or the distinction between like use case, experimental statistics, and official statistics, isn't it? So, I mean, there's definitely a gap between experimental statistics and official statistics, but um, as I understood you, we, we don't, I understand the experimental statistics that we still look at all the quality dimensions, but we don't succeed in being good enough in the quality dimensions. That's different from a use case, like the, ex the first experiments where we don't care about it, right? So in an experimental statistics setup, we know that accuracy for this is not good enough and whatever, like the timeliness could be, it could be fast, but now that data provider just sends us the data late. So. And then the next step is that we, are, we kind of make a check on all the dimensions. Do you agree with that, or do we have a different, di different kind no, of setup? No, I absolutely agree with that. In fact, I, I think I wrote, we, are, we don't fulfill. We don't fulfill all quality dimensions, giving more or less as a, as a given that we try seriously to do so. I fully agree. I never say that we ignore. Uh, 
uh, absolutely, I fully agree with that. But as you say, it, we are not yet there on the output side. Now, there are certain things, there are certain quality dimensions that are just not relevant for experimental statistics. For instance, you don't set up a process to exchange regularly paradata with a data provider if the experimental statistics is just based on data set that you get once. So this, the, there are many, it's not that you ignore anything, but there are some quality dimensions that just don't enter into the game in, in the stage of experimental statistics. May I pose my question? Okay, can you hear me? Okay, many thanks for your inspiring talk. I have a question regarding uh, customers uh, versus citizens uh, versus respondents. I think that in this uh, triangle there is all official statistics and I'm, I'm asking myself first of all and then you, uh, what can we do to uh, uh, focus on the fact that uh, national official statistics uh, and European official statistics are from citizens for citizens? So, uh, we are capturing their behavior uh, in, in their uh, situation as customers. And according to me, uh, there is only a way to uh, use, use their contribution as citizens, that is making them cooperating, uh, losing the privacy issue, just to make an example. So, what, what do you think about this? Are there further questions from the audience? Uh, uh, maybe are there questions from uh, the, the, the outside, the people that you from the uh, no, not, not for the moment. Not, not quite a question, just a, a, a thought. On the, the in the, you have a switch, you have a picture, you have three switches uh, you need to turn on. And I, I agree, and I think that is the, actually what's, uh, What's encouraging with all these European projects you, or initiatives you just uh, uh, outlined, because actually this is, uh, this is I think, something new. We, 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 I mean, waiting for the uh, individual national statistical office to take initiative has been very difficult. And the main difficulty is the resource issue, the resource issue. And then that's the point, I think, goes back to somewhere earlier where you talk about it could be, it's not replacing, it's not, the, it's not supplementing, we're creating new statistics and so on and so forth. It's not necessarily reducing the existing sort of statistical production cost. And I think that is practically is, is, is actually more greater importance than just conceptually. Because I, so I, I, I imagine that at the end of the day, there will be Eurostat or whatever could, is, uh, needs to push a further switch even when all these switch, switch, switches are on, to actually get into action. I mean, if, if the national office, yeah, I have methodology, I have the enabler, I have everything, but I don't have resource to engage new statistics, basically. That's what I have to do, I mean, things like that. So some kind of a push from the top, the Eurostat, kind of, this could be the new regulation, these statistics we are needed and everything. So from some, point of view, I think that would also in the end be, be necessary. It, you can't just wait, say, I have everything's ready, and then they will just jump on it. I don't think so. Yes, yeah. uh, yeah, so I'll start from Li Chun. Of course, um, once that all the switches are closed, one of the switches is legal. Is legal. Uh, if you, if under the assumption that the legal text of the 223, once approved, under the assumption that is approved, will not deviate too much from that, there are basically already uh, legal obligations that are enforceable. And I want to stress, it will not be enough. But this is um, it's, it's a big step forward. And. With all this puzzle, as you see, it, the Eurostat, uh, not Eurostat, Eurostat is, is coordinating, but it's the work for the whole ESS, uh, uh, or NSI that are represented here, uh, several NSI that are represented here are um, uh, protagonists <laughs> in, in, this, in this play. Um, of course, it, it's inconceivable that we prepare the table and then we, <laughs> we, we, don't, uh, we, don't, we didn't kick off, right? So, 
uh, I, and I think the complexity of the challenges at the legal data protection uh, methodology is such that I don't think any NSI has enough muscle uh, to, to do this. I think uh, even if he had, maybe maybe wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be worth. So this is really when the um, subsidiarity principle comes into play. This is one of the things that either we do together collaboratively or we don't do. Uh, so uh, this motivates also me personally to, to work in Eurostat in, in these projects. Um, I would like to thank Monica for having a uh, uh, because I admit I had in mind to put two final slides on, on what you mentioned uh, that I used in, in, in previous uh, talks and then I thought it is too long or Daniela <laughs> will kick me so I but I was hoping somebody to raise this so let me first say very clearly that uh, and I will reply on the privacy aspect afterwards I disagree with who him, whoever claim that privacy should be relaxed. And I come to this in a moment. So uh, on the contrary, just be, because we want to have, we are serving citizens, we're not only measuring citizens, we are serving citizens. Because of that, I would like privacy to be taken even more seriously. Uh, uh, and I don't consider it to, to be co in contradiction. On the contrary, uh, this will help quality. So I'm planning to give a presentation on privacy and technology and quality. Uh, and, um, I wanted to anticipate something, but to lack of space, I did not do. So let's put privacy aspect a little bit aside. So there is a strategic, uh, 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 besides data protection, we also need to gain the acceptance by the public, right? Uh, by the citizen. Citizens should not be feared as data units or data subjects that we might interfere with their uh, data, data protection. On the contrary, ideally, we would work genuinely and also communicate that the citizen have to gain from the NSI plugging into this, uh, this, this, this big data because they have nothing to fear on the individual level. Uh, tax authority cannot use our data and uh, it's not only written in the code of practice, will be technology will be there to make sure that they are reassured on this. But at the same time, using big data that are generated by the citizen, and I think belong to the, to the citizen, at least in ethically, uh, today are used only for, by private sector, right? How the citizen gain from their data? Either because they use, thanks to this data that they provide to the operator, they get some service, no, location, maps. So I benefit because I use the service that is using my data, that that's a legitimate. Or maybe a bit less legitimate, I use this as a currency to pay, I pay with my data the service. I'm not really a friend of the concept that personal data can be monetized, but this is what hap what's happening. Now, official statistics provide a flow by which citizen, uh, data from the citizen with the head of customers, yes, but eventually go back to the citizen in the form of public st statistics for free. So the, the reason why should only Google, Facebook gain private profit, private gain, gain privately from the citizen data? At least we add uh, one more uh, water cycle where the uh, information from the citizen fall back, rain back on the cities and in the form of public statistics that proudly are public, are for free, are given to everybody. And the more detailed they can be, the more we enrich the citizen. So I consider NSI, the role of NSI as a mediator between the citizen as a data producer and the citizen as information consumer and as a way to democratize, uh, to, to regain social control also or at least a social purpose of the, uh, the data that are produced by the citizen. So this uh, positive aspect is credible. This narrative, no, no, it's not only a narrative, this, 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 um, this goal is credible only to the extent that we can be genuinely, provide genuine safeguards that uh, the individual will not have anything to fear, at least not from us, <laughs> uh, uh, for the use of the uh, data. And for this, we need to take 
privacy aspects even more seriously. Now, I understand that there is a, there is a tension now in certain statistical office between you know, the, pr the application of pri privacy, privacy rules uh, creates some tension. And it's not up to me to, let's say, discuss a specific case, right? So for sure, not specific case in, in here. But I have to, I would like to say that in my opinion, G for me, GDPR, in the many respects, is a brilliant piece of, piece, piece of text. In my opinion, the more I study it, because I need to apply it at the technological level, I approach GDPR as an engineer, as a list of requirements that I have to take care into developing technologies, right? The more I read it, the more I appreciate. Um, it, it, it's brilliant in many respects. And I don't think the GDPR is stopping. For Emenodeta, e-privacy is stopping, but perhaps e-privacy will be, will be changed uh, soon. I think we can adhere to GDPR thanks to technology and better and the better process processes and in, even improve on the on the privacy i don't consider privacy to be an obstacle at least not for new data sources where we have to build from scratch new processes deploy uh, new technologies so we are uh, from scratch i understand that it's much more difficult and much more painful to do so where you're working with administrative data where there is a legacy where there are um, constraints, interdependencies, uh, and the legacy, from, from an engineering point of view, the legacy is, is, is painful, right? Still, I would never subscribe to the statement that the solution is to relax privacy. But let's say we have to, I don't, I don't know what need to work, but it's a may, maybe, maybe, maybe we have to find the new, 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 new aspects to this. And regarding what Piero said, uh, I was mentioning in the presentation about reporting between the data holder and the NSI. You touched on the topic on how we communicate uncertainty to, to the users. Uh, on this, I think this is, this is important. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure there are specificities that make the task different or more or less difficult when you release data based on MNO data as compared to data based on survey or registry. I think communicating uncertainty is, is a challenge, but it's also a duty, because by communicating uncertainty, you also educate. Uh, and it's, uh, you increase the statistical literature, you call it, uh, it's, it's an education, it's an education part. So I did not touch this, uh, Piero, not because it's not important, but because Daniela otherwise will kill me. And, um, uh, <laughs> and also, uh, Monica said, engaging the citizens citizen science, I, I would even suggest that we start talking about citizen statistics, right? citizen science is another story. So we proposed in a paper three years ago to, to drop citizen science and to talk citizen statistics because there are specificities in citizen statistics that you do not find in citizen, in citizen science. So why we have to follow the other acronym? We invent our own. <laughs> and, 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 and citizen statistics is interesting. I did not cover because so I had to scope somehow, not to say that this is less important. Maybe you invite me next year, I talk about citizen statistics. And uh, as I told you before, Data Governance Act opens new legal enabler that ISTAT and the legal health service in ISTAT should carefully look at. Because maybe you find there the legal enabler that are not yet in the statistical legislations. Huh? Us? Um, you know that the revision of 223 is done in a participative process, uh, gathering ideas. And from ISTAT, there is a statement uh, about this issue. So if we can find it, I think that we can say thanks to ISTAT also. Yeah, yeah, but I was referring to the Data Governance Act. Not to, to, the Data Governance Act already has this. Thanks to it, I, I didn't know because I didn't follow the Data Governance Act. Two to three, yes, I know. To the, the DGA, no. But in DGA, data altruism and data donations are there. This is extremely relevant for smart uh, surveys. Mm. And I stop here because Daniela. No, no, not to the, the people of the cafe, not me. <laughs>
Well, uh, so I think that we can thank everybody. Uh, the discussion may go on during the breaks, during the lunch, and even with the uh, exchange of emails later. And so well, I thank everybody together with the speaker for the very, very nice master's uh, lecture. So thank you. And please enjoy the coffee.